I'm going to talk today about what is the role of an occupational therapist, so what do we do, the effect of COPD on your activities of daily living, what is energy conservation, how we can use that to manage your COPD, any equipment available to maximise your independence at home, and a little bit about community services and future planning. So first of all, what is an occupational therapist? Occupational therapy is concerned with maximising your ability to carry out your everyday tasks as independently as possible. That level of independence will change as years go by, as degrees, disease progresses. So when we say it's as independently as possible at that moment in time, so you'll be assessed at any given moment in time to see what we can do then and planning for the future. We look at the impact of shortness of breath on your activities of daily living. So we look at your home environment, how is that impacting on you? Is there anything that we can do or recommend to make things easier or safer for you there? Looking at your personal activities of daily living, that's like getting up, getting washed, getting dressed, getting to the toilet, getting around the house. Domestic activities of daily living, things like housework, cooking, cleaning, if you're doing it, if someone else is doing it, do you want to continue doing it? Or is it a role you're happy to relinquish? Some people like to be able to continue cooking as long as possible, other people are happy to get rid of it as quick as possible because they want someone else to do it. Yeah. And leisure activities. That's things like, have you got the energy to go out for dinner? Do you want to continue going to a club? But if someone else cooks for you, you've got the energy to go for a club. So it's really what's important to you. The effects of COPD on activities of daily living will vary from individual to individual. It may make it difficult to engage in your social activities. It may make it difficult to get up out of bed in the morning. Depending on where you are in the disease, and where you are medically at that moment in time. If you're unwell, if you've got an exacerbation, you're on antibiotics, you're likely to be more impacted on than if you're at your normal baseline level. One of the things as an occupational therapist we look at is energy conservation. It means looking at your daily routines to find ways to reduce the amount of effort you need to perform certain tasks, eliminating other tasks, and building rest in through the day. So if you know, if I try and do all of everything in the morning, I'm going to get up, wash, dress, go down and make my breakfast, wash up after breakfast, then it's time to prepare lunch, have lunch. By afternoon, you're exhausted. You're fit for nothing. If you had built a little bit of rest in, maybe got up, had a cup of tea, taken a few minutes, then got yourself washed and dressed, then taken another hour of rest, and then moved on, maybe moved lunch back a little bit, but you're building the rest periods in so that you're able to do what you need to do during the daytime. There are four principles, planning, prioritizing, work simplification and adaptation. That's ad adapting the task and adapting your home environment, maybe moving things around at home. Planning, how do you use your time on daily activities? If you plan with a timetable, well, it's Monday is there, I'm gonna change my sheets. You're not going to decide that's the day, I'm also gonna clean the bathroom and wash the floors. If they're the things you need to do during the week and they're, they're weekly tasks, that you spread them throughout the week and then you plan to do them at a time where you've got the most energy. And nobody can tell you that. You're the one who knows that. I can't say you should do it in the morning because the morning might be the time you feel exhausted. After lunch, you've had a rest, you might have more energy. So that's something that's very personal to each individual. So you're planning the week's activities in advance. This is something we started to do in work. We have a timetable now every day. Everything's put on a timetable makes things so much easier when it goes to plan. The plan gets thrown out the window on a regular basis, as happens in all our lives, but at least there's a vague plan in your head. And it also decreases the level of stress, because if you think of all the things you have to do, you start to stress about the fact that I might not have the energy, whereas if you know you've got a plan for it all, then it makes it that much easier to deal with. Becoming an expert at balancing the rest and work. So what you have to do, you have to do, but if the things you don't have to do and you'd really feel like having a rest that day, and trying to prepare. So you're planning you're going to do the bathroom, prepare and bring everything up with you. Take a 20 minute rest and then start to do the task. So you're preparing, moving everything to the place you need to do it. Then if you need to take a rest, build the rest time into it. It's gonna take you an hour, give yourself 10 minutes at the beginning of the task to do it, 10 minutes at the end to rest. It just gives you that little bit extra. So it's prioritizing what is essential and what's non-essential. Accepting help when available. Some people would like to take more help, but it's not available. Some people are very house proud and things are only done properly if I do it myself. And that's something that you really need to take a little bit of a look back at and see, well, if I let someone else do it, will that give me more energy so that when they come to visit, 
I'll actually be able to have a chat with them. I'm not spending all the time cleaning the house before my daughter comes or before my home help arrives because she just wouldn't want her to think I'm messy. <laughs> but if your daughter comes and you'd prefer to be able to spend time and have a chat than have a, a tired yourself out by tidying up something that maybe she wanted to do and would have done far quicker and far easier. Work simplification. So looking at things and how you can make them easier to accomplish. Sitting down takes 25% less energy than standing. We stand at the sink to peel our vegetables. We stand at the sink to wash up. Um, but, you know, that's taking more energy than it needs to. So looking at simplifying. If you're filling a saucepan of water, you're, pushing it, you're carrying it to the hob, that takes energy. If you put it on and you can push it along this counter as much as possible, it takes less energy. Trying to maintain a good posture. If you're stooped over, breathing is more difficult, your lungs are compromised. You get tired, you end up falling into that posture, especially when you're standing. If you're sitting, you can keep yourself in a better posture. It allows you to breathe more easily. And try not to breathe, hold your breath during activity. We all do it during exercise. I spend my entire Pilates class being told, and breathe. <laughs> but it makes it easier. You get more oxygen as you breathe. But as we're doing a thing that's, that exerts a lot of effort, we tend to hold our breath. Locating items to where they're used most. If you've got your kettle, the likelihood is your tea bags, your sugar and your cups are near at hand. The fridge is probably the furthest thing away. We do it automatically, but it does make things easier for us. Consider moving a bed downstairs or using a commode. If downstairs living is not an option, or you don't really want to sleep downstairs because you've always slept upstairs, consider the fact that the grants are one-time deal. So if you want a level access shower and you're going to put it upstairs, apply for a stair lift at the same time if you can, because we don't want a lovely shower upstairs and you can no longer go up the stairs. Adapting a home environment, use of a commode. A lot of people don't like them, but if it saves you going up and down the stairs 10 times during the day or trying to get to the bathroom at night, in the middle of the night, it's a safer option. Unfortunately, most falls occur at night time when someone's trying to get to the bathroom because they don't turn the lights on because it's night time, they don't want to wake the rest of the people in the house. And you're half asleep, you're trying to get there in a hurry and if a commode was beside your bed, for those occasions, it would make things easier and safer. We talked about the four steps of energy conservation. So how would that be applied at a practical level? Sitting in front of the basin to complete grooming tasks. If you're shaving, if you're having a strip wash at the sink, sitting will make it easier than standing. Arranging a bath time or time to have a wash for when you have stamina. And if that means it's not done till three o'clock in the afternoon, no one's really going to mind. It's gonna be done at a time where it suits you best. Preparing the area and leaving things as close by as possible. Using bits of equipment. I'll take advantage to show them off. So, long handle sponge. Wash yourself. A little bit easier than normal. If you need to take a break during it, make sure there's a towel nearby that you can keep yourself warm. Or some people use the toweling bathrobe, so you're not rubbing to dry yourself. You just put that on, it dries you, and you just have to finish drying yourself off. It takes that much less energy. And use of things like a shoehorn because sometimes bending down, you can lose your breath more when you bend down than when you're sitting upright. So long-handled shoehorns make things that much easier. During your domestic activities of daily living, organizing your kitchen, keeping everything that you normally use together, sitting down for preparation or for even washing up at the sink. You, you know, the, quick, the more you sit down, the easier it is. Using ready-prepared vegetables. They're, sim they're available in most shops. It just it makes it easier for you. You're not wasting the time peeling and chopping. If you're going to be making dinner for five o'clock and you've, you feel you've got energy at 11, you could maybe start prepare some of the vegetables at that point, then take a rest before you continue to do it. So doing it, planning in advance as much as possible. Eliminating unnecessary steps, sometimes using dishwasher, letting dishes drain dry first of all, and then just finishing them off. Soaking pots in hot water with detergent saves you scrubbing away. And looking for help for the heavy housework. Things like changing your bed sheets, cleaning the bathroom. They're the things that people mainly struggle with and they're the first thing that people will tend to ask for help with because they're the one thing they can't do. Trying to change the sheets in the double bed is difficult at the best of times. When you're struggling with breath, it's not a nice task. Shopping, having someone come and help you or having the man deliver. Most shops nowadays deliver and if you've got someone who's internet savvy, most you can order online, save you having to go. But if you are going to go, having a plan and having someone with you or just knowing the route of the shop 
as much as possible. So you're eliminating that wandering up and down lanes like I tend to do an impulse buy. Considering using a laundry service and especially things like sitting down to iron and iron as little as possible. Energy conservation and lever activities. Trying to know, well, if I'm going to go for dinner that day, I plan nothing else for the day. If I know that that's something I really want to do, I really want to be able to properly engage with people. And if you're going out for dinner, reserve somewhere to go. Book a table. Make sure there's car parking nearby or someone who's going to drop you at the door and then pick you up from the door just to save as much energy as possible. The same as medical, attending a medical appointment. If you have to come in here for clinic, you know yourself, clinic is exhausting because it takes a long time to get to see a doctor. You're here, but if you've come in in time, you're not rushing, you're being picked up, things are a little bit easier. So here's our perching stew. And I'll bring this one over as well. So the perching stool is available through the community occupational therapist or through most chemists nowadays do the home craft catalogue. So they are available to purchase privately. Murray's Medical on Talbot Street, you know, the green chemist, they are one of the main suppliers. But most chemists like Doherty's at Bowman House and the one in Omni, I think it's a Doc Morris, they now have the catalogue. So you can go in and say, I would like to get one of those. I know I'm not going to see an occupation, a community occupational therapist for a couple of months, but it really would make a difference. They will order the piece of equipment in for you. So there's something that are a little bit more freely available than the once were. You can put this at the sink in the bathroom. You can put it to have a wash. You're sitting down. You're still doing it yourself. You're not relying on someone to help you, but you're sitting down to do it. You can then have one in the kitchen. So you can sit to wash the dishes, peel the vegetables, even sometimes people, use, we use them in our kitchen here with patients to practice. If someone's getting tired standing at the hob, they can take a seat and then stand up when they need to, but they're not having to walk away from what they're doing. So they're actually one of the handiest little pieces of equipment that you can get. And an over toilet frame. So how many people struggle to stand from the very low toilets? that we have in standard in this country. They're about 16 inches, but most people need them to be about 18. And people are pulling on the sink, on the door handle, on the toilet roll holder to stand up. So this one's actually a wee bit high for me even. It just sits over your toilet, you've got your handles, and it makes it taller. Again, we give these out here as a piece of equipment sometimes from the hospital or your community occupational therapist. They're a little bit more specialised so you can purchase them again through any of the chemists in town but sometimes there's something that you probably should have someone recommend because it depends on it needs to be set to a certain height now some of the chemists like Murray's Medical will set it for you some of the other places might not have that expertise but they are available or sometimes it's just the raised toilet seat if there's not enough space between the wall and the toilet or the bath or whatever you can get just the seat end of it and it just raises up you can hire, you can get a private occupational therapist in the community and there is an association of occupational therapists and if you ring them they'll give you the list of the people who work privately and if you go through that list that means they're insured by the association so you know you're getting someone who's got a degree, who practices and who's an expert in what they're doing. I've also brought up the sponge, the shoehorn, the grabber. This is something you can pick up anywhere. Even, I think B&Q and those kind of places are now doing these, they're doing rails, they do a lot of things. But this is something you can pick up anywhere and again, it's just a simple little piece of equipment. And the sock aid, some people love these. When you're sitting down, you don't have to bend down to put your sock on, you put your sock on this. This is actually good for, for tights or stockings because it's not plastic, it's got the terry cloth. You put your sock on, you sit down, you put your foot in it, and you pull it up. And it comes on without you having to bend down. So sometimes it, makes, it means that you can do it yourself rather than relying on somebody else to do it. And it can be any kind of reason. Sometimes you just struggle to bend down because you've got sore hips, you've got problems with breathing, you've had a hip replacement. Anything can make these a little handy thing. Community occupational therapists are based in the local health centres. So anybody can refer to a community occupational therapist. I know the girls in COPD Outreach refer on a regular basis for you. Um, if you're seen here in the hospital, we can give certain pieces of equipment as essential for getting home. And if it's not, we will then refer on to the community occupational therapist for follow-up. Um, but you can also phone up 
your public health nurse can make that referral, but you can make it yourself as well. And they will provide the bits of equipment to make it easier for you at home, and they'll also assess you in your home environment. When I see you here in the hospital, you're not at your best. You've probably come in with an infection. You're going home medically stable and medically better, but possibly not quite 100% how you were before. So, and it's the hospital. So the beds are different, the chairs, height is different, everything's not yours. The occupational therapists who work in the community are the best people to assess you because they assess you in your own environment and how it impacts on you. And they will also give advice regarding the grant. So they normally, if you apply for a grant for housing adaptations or stair lifts or showers, they will ask for an occupational therapist report. It has to be the community occupational therapist who gives that report because they have been the people who assess the house. So they'll recommend exactly what you need and they'll be the people who give the report into Dublin City or Fingal County Council. We can't do it from here because we, we don't know the house. Or you can hire a private occupational therapist and if you do to, to apply for a grant, hire someone privately, you put that costing into the grant application and it get reimbursed with your grant. Final hints and tips. Don't think you have to do things the way you've always done them. Things are changing. You know, your disease will progress and if you're managing at a certain level now, things may change in the future. And things may change on a, a fluctuating basis for you. If you're well, you'll do things a certain way. If you're having a bad couple of days or you have an infection, things will change. They may go back to how they were before. So don't be disheartened if sometimes you suddenly can't do something you've always done. If needed, rest before and after the activities. If you become tired during an activity, stop and rest. Don't rush and continue, keep going until there's a point of no return. You might need to finish it another day or you might need to just take an hour break and then go back to it. So if that means that the washing up gets half done and then gets left and you come back, then that's okay. Ask for help and accept it when it's offered. Don't just continue to fight for, I've always done it myself. Sometimes it is time to put that little bit of pride aside and accept the help that's offered. Energy is like money, you only have so much, so be careful how you spend it. Because when it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> You're not gonna get it back. You're going to need to rest, you're going to need to save, and you're going to need to start again. So it's budgeting your energy like you budget your money for the whole month, like a whole day, and seeing what you can do with it. And thank you.